Hey everyone. So uh, I'm going to give a talk right now about uh, functional and reactive programming. And the reason I named it this way is because it's kind of kind of going to be in two sections. I'm going to deal with the functional programming part and the reactive part. Um, you might be here because of RxJava, which is kind of the technology that's pushed this whole functional reactive programming thing on us all. Um, but I'm actually not really going to be focusing that much on on RxJava. Um, I've seen a lot of introduction to RxJava talks, and this is sort of taking the place of that. And uh, the, the issue I see with a lot of the intro to RxJava talks is that they tend to like go over people's heads instantly. Um, they don't really explain the concepts behind like why would you even want to use it in the first place. And so that's what I'm trying to endeavor here. If you're already using RxJava, I hope you get something out of this too because uh, it might break it down, break down FRP in a way that you haven't really thought about before. So really, what I'm here to talk about is functional reactive programming. Um, and I'm going to talk about it in two sections. And I'm actually going to start with the reactive part first. Uh, I don't know why. I just felt like that would make more sense. So uh, let's start with an example and with nice big pictures, because that makes my life easier. Um, so the example that I'm going to keep using throughout this talk is one of a light switch and a light bulb. Because uh, you can imagine this in code as two separate modules. One module is the light switch module, and one module is the light bulb module. And obviously, what I want is you know, when the light switch is switched in one direction for the light bulb to turn on, and when it's switched in the other direction for the light bulb to turn off. So that's very simple stuff. Anyone could code that. Um, but then the question becomes, how exactly do these two modules couple together? And what Reactive Streams is all about is kind of viewing it in maybe a different way than you're, than you're used to. So the traditional way that you're sort of used to, um, I'm stealing from CycleJS um, and Andrew Stalls who had this great idea of using uh, kind of half arrows to show who's actually doing the, the pushing of data here. So if we move this arrow over to where the light switch is, that we have is that the light switch itself is the one pushing data. And so you might think of the light switch as being proactive and the light bulb itself is being passive. That is, when the switch is changing, it goes and tells the light bulb, I would like you to change your state to either be powered on or powered off. Uh, and so if you were to look at that in just like very simple code, you might have the switch class up here. Um, and the switch class has a reference to the light bulb. And whenever the switch class is, you know, whenever it gets flipped, then it's going to explicitly call this light bulb power method to, to change the configuration of the light bulb. So that's the proactive way of doing things. Now, if we, if we move the arrow to the other side, what does that mean about this interaction? Uh, what that means is that now we have the light bulb being reactive and the switch itself being an observable thing that you can, you can listen to what's happening there. And so what the code might look like in that situation is when I create my light bulb, I construct it, uh, but then I'm also passed in a reference to the switch. And the switch itself has some method that allows me to listen to its changes and flips. And so here what's happening is I'm adding this flip listener. It's very simple. Just basically whenever the flip is enabled, then turn on the light bulb, otherwise turn it off. Uh, but the interesting thing here is that now the, now the uh, light switch is no longer directly controlling the light bulb. Instead, the light bulb is reacting to changes of the light switch's state. So this is the very simple observer pattern that you might have learned in college if you read like the Gang of Four stuff or the head first design patterns or whatever books they're using these days. Um, so what does, that, what does that mean about this relationship, though, um, whether you go with proactive versus reactive coding? Because the end result is the same thing. I flip the switch, and the light bulb either turns on or off. What does this really matter uh, in terms of code? And so there's three questions I, I want to pose, and uh, kind of shows how these two are actually inverses of each other. But one is not necessarily, one is not necessarily better than the other. Uh, but I end up liking reactive more in the end. And so the first question is, who controls the light bulb? So who actually tells the light bulb whether to turn on or off? Where does that logic come from? In the case of proactive, that logic, who is calling power? It's other people. So the light bulb itself does not control itself. Instead, it's all these other modules who choose to turn the light bulb on or off. Whereas in the reactive model, the light bulb itself is the one who determines when it turns on or off. Yes, it's listening to something else to determine when it should be turning itself on and off, but ultimately it's up to the light bulb itself to figure out that logic. The other side of things is to ask, what determines what the switch controls? So 
the switch, when I change the switch, what exactly is it going to affect? In this case, in the proactive case, it's the switch itself that determines what it controls when it uh, gets flipped. So in the proactive example, I flip the switch, and then inside the switch's code, it says, OK, now go to my light bulb and actually go change the state of this light bulb. Conversely, in the reactive model, what determines that the switch controls is just whatever other modules happen to be listening to the switch. So now the switch no longer has to be in charge of like what exactly it's controlling. And then the third question I would ask is, is the light bulb synchronous? That is, when you call the light bulb to be powered, is that like an immediate thing or not? And in proactive, yes, it is synchronous. So someone else outside of light bulb calls light bulb .power, and that instantly gets, that instantly just happens, the state changes. Whereas in reactive, this is a, kind of an inherently asynchronous setup because I've actually just set up a scenario where I'm listening to someone else and when that someone else calls something, that's when I change the light bulb. So it's this inherently asynchronous setup. And what, what I'm kind of leaving out here is that the switch itself, it's sort of non-deterministic whether the switch is asynchronous or not. It could be some synchronous implementation of switch that just like goes through on, off, on, off, on, off, and then ex finishes execution. Or it could be asynchronous. Um, but what's interesting here is that the light bulb itself can become asynchronous regardless of what the switch is doing. So from these three questions, what I really feel like is the, the key difference here is one of modularity. In that proactive, the modules control each other. We have this light bulb and light switch, and the switch directly controls the light bulb. Whereas in reactive, the modules really control themselves. So, they, so in the case of the light bulb, it defines what its input is. Its input is a stream of you know, booleans that tells it whether it should be turning on or off. But it doesn't actually have to be directly coupled to the light switch anymore. And I think that's a really powerful concept. Um, and so to, to give it a slightly more solid example, so here's the Trello app. Here's like the, the home page that you load up. And uh, on that home page, you have a list of boards that are displayed. And those lists of boards are supplied by a database. And so if we have, you know, we show the same sort of relationship between the switch and the light bulb, between the database and this thing's just flicker? Okay. Between the database and the UI. So if I do the proactive way, where I have the database pushing data to the UI, I really have to ask myself, like, why? Why is that the case? That when I go and change the database, that the database has to know to go and check to see if, like, is the user viewing this screen? And if they're viewing this screen, go and push this extra data to that screen. Like, that seems a little weird to me. It's this weird tight coupling between the database and the UI that's using it. I don't get that. I would much rather it be like this, where instead it's reactive. And whenever the database changes, whenever there's new boards or new information about the user, then the UI automatically pulls from that database what information it needs. This makes a lot more intuitive sense to me. It's essentially the UI reacting to other state within the application. And now the database no longer has to know exactly what it's providing data to either. So it creates this nice modularity. So how would we actually uh, go about implementing this in kind of a sane way, a way that would uh, help out, actually help out users? Um, so I, before I just showed you the kind of the light bulb creation side of things, this would be the actual switch implementation. <coughs> so we'd have this switch, and it would have an on flip listener. Let me just double check. All right. So it'd have its on flip listener interface. And that's something that anyone can uh, implement and listen to when the switch changes. And then uh, on top of that, you would add this. Here I have a method called add on flip listener. And I'm just going to kind of hand wave about how that is actually set up. But essentially, you know, you add that interface. And then whenever the thing flips, then we would call any of the uh, listeners that we had there. But there are two problems I see with this kind of naive implementation. The first problem I see is that every listener is unique. So my on flip listener is very specific to my switch. And if I'm going to be doing reactive programming, like if I use it in one place, sure, it's not so bad. But if I'm planning on like building my entire application off of the idea of reactive systems, of reactive streams, then this is going to get real tiresome real fast. Because I want something that can be generalized upon. I want something that I can keep reusing over and over, the same concept everywhere. I don't want to have to keep writing new interfaces for every new listener I'm working with. And indeed, if you work in Android, that's probably something you've experienced, where there's like set on click listener, set on drag listener, set on touch listener. There's a new 
a listener interface for every single thing that can possibly happen. The other issue that I have with this is that the listener requires direct access to the switch. So my light bulb needs to be able to go directly to the switch and say, add me as a listener. And that kind of sucks too, because part of, like, part of the whole um, thesis for why this is great is because I can have things be nice and modular. If I'm having to go directly to the switch, well, it's not modular anymore. Now it's still tightly coupled. And what I really like is for the ability to listen to the switch to be something that could be passed around. Like maybe there could be like multiple layers of, of modules between the actual switch and the light bulb. So what I really want is in my switch class, I want some method flips. And I want it to return something that I can pass around that represents this stream of data that I can be getting from the switch. So that's where the question marks are there. Um, and for that, we're going to look at this chart, which is a really cool chart that um, one of the inventors of reactive streams put up in one of his talks once, which I found very influential. And it's essentially like the four fundamental side effects of function returns. So these are the four different types of things that a function can return. You can pretty much generalize any function return to these four things. And we've split them into two axes. Um, on the top axes, we have whether or not you're returning a single item or you're returning multiple items. And on the other axis, we have whether you're returning those synchronously or asynchronously over time. So for a single synchronous item, that's just T. That's a generic type T. It can be anything. It could be an integer. It could be a string, whatever. If you have many things synchronously, then you're returning essentially something iterable. So it could be a list. It could be a collection of any kind. Um, it could be an iterator. But it's something that you can go over the entire iterable at once synchronously without blocking execution at all. So those are pretty simple. That's what you work with a lot in proactive coding. Um, in asynchronous coding, what if we want one result? Well, then we can have a future. And we call that future. We wait for whenever that one result comes back. But it comes back at some future time. It doesn't have to be right now. And so, but the problem is none of these actually satisfy what I want. What I want from the switch is multiple uh, multiple booleans representing what state the switch is in over time. And for that, what we have is this observable type. And that's sort of what RxJava or streams in general have presented to the world is this observable type. And what you use it for, so now I've got my switch, I've got my flisk method, and it returns an observable. And in my static light bulb creation method now, instead of passing in a reference to the switch, instead I'm passing in an observable. And you'll notice that these two observables have the same generic type. So that means that they can, I can take this flips, this uh, observable object that I got from switch, and I can put it through whatever rigmarole I want. And then eventually it ends up at the light bulb create. Um, it can just plug right in since it's the same type. And then the rest of the code is fairly similar to what I showed before with the add-on flip listener. Only now, uh, what we're calling is observable.subscribe. So we're saying we're subscribing to uh, whatever uh, emissions that you are going to give out. So that's what, uh, that's kind of the basis for all of these streams is this observable type. And I'm not going to go too much into the deep philosophy of like why if observable operates the way it does, but I'm going to at least tell you how, how it, uh, how it works on over, how it's designed. So observable is essentially a collection over time. It's a collection of items emitted over time. And to show that, uh, they've come up with this idea of a marble diagram. And a marble diagram gives you a good way to represent these like, items over time. And so the, line, the horizontal line that you see there uh, represents time. And then the circles represent items that have been emitted. So you can imagine that like, the red circle is a true and the blue circle is a false in this case, if that were the switch observable. Um, there are two more interesting properties of observables. One is that they can have endings. Um, and that makes sense. So in the marble diagrams, uh, you would have this vertical line to represent the end of time. Uh, and this sort of makes sense because like, some streams obviously have an end to the data. So if I'm like, streaming a video and I'm doing it through like, an observable, then clearly the end of the video happens, the stream's over. It turns out it's very useful to be able to know when there's going to be no more data coming. Whereas a light switch may never have an ending. It's possible to have an observable that never has an ending since the switch obviously will keep existing for all time uh, and never deteriorate to dust or anything like that as eh, whatever. OK. Also, you can have errors. Errors can happen. That rep that's represented by an x. Uh, and it's another terminal event. And the, that terminal event essentially means something went horribly wrong, and now we can no longer observe this stream. 
So in the case of a switch, maybe the switch got broken. Maybe someone took a hammer to it and, and broke the switch. Now it doesn't work anymore, so this whole stream has to be shut down. And it's also very useful to um, be able to tell when a, a stream of data is no longer going to be working. So that's essentially the observable type. Now I'm going to make the most awkward transition of all time and talk about functional programming for a bit. <laughs> um, so the issue, so well, I'll get back to reactive in a bit, but I need to take a break to f talk about functional programming because it becomes an important part of the next thing I want to talk about with reactive streams. Uh, so functional programming, uh, if you've never done functional programming before, here's the great introduction to it. Um, I spent a lot of time talking with my friends who do functional programming for work about what exactly functional programming is. And it turns out it's, it's a definition that's actually fairly hard to pin down. Um, it's one of those things where it's sort of like you, you get the feel of functional programming. You don't necessarily be able to sum it up in a sentence. Um, but what I eventually came to in order to like explain functional programming to other people is that it's really all about functions. Surprise. <laughs> um, it's about functions. You have an input. Something happens in it, and you get an output in the end. Um, but it's not, to me, functional programming isn't just about functions. It's about pure functions. And what do I mean by pure functions? A pure function is a function that has no side effects. All right, so now I'm doing that annoying thing where I'm defining things based on other definitions. Let's look at what a side effect is as a counterexample of what a pure function is. So suppose I've written this add method in Java. Uh, I guess it just supply it two numbers, and it adds it together. That seems fairly simple. Um, besides the fact there's already a plus operator in Java, let's ignore that that exists for the time being. Uh, the method signature seems pretty promising. I'm adding two integers. I'm returning an integer. It's a static method, so it's not even connected to any particular class. And if we look at the last line of this method, uh, it looks like it'll do what I expect. So no side effects here. Except for there's a big blank space here that should feel kind of awkward. What, what's in that blank space there? Uh-oh. <laughs> the first thing it does is it calls systems.printline. All right, so now my add function also prints to the console. Why? <laughs> Why does it do that? Who knows? Uh, but the real problem here is that this is a side effect. This has nothing to do with any of the inputs or the outputs. It's having this effect on the global state of the application without any, like, it makes no sense why this is here. All right? And there's still this weird blank gap in here. What's in that blank gap now? Oops. It also, calling the add method also just kills the application. <laughs> so that's a pretty severe side effect. Uh, and so side effects kind of suck. And the, the issue with this is that just looking at the method signature, I had no idea that these things were going to happen. I have to actually go into the function and read through it to figure out what exactly is going to happen. So that's one problematic side effect. Let's look at another problematic side effect. So suppose I've got a list of numbers, and I want to determine whether the sum of those numbers is equal to the product of those numbers. So the sum of 1, 2, and 3 is 6. Uh, 1 times 2 times 3 is also 6. So theoretically, I should, uh, the answer sum equals product should be true. Uh, we look at my sum uh, method signature. I take in a list of numbers. I output an integer. So, so far, everything seems fine. I look at my actual implementation here. It's a little wonky. Uh, but in particular, I want to call out this one wonky line here. Um, if you didn't know, it, know, know this, on any list, you can call the iterator method. And then you can, as you iterate through, if you call remove, it also it removes it from the iterator, and it also removes it from the original list. So uh, what the end result of this sum method is, is yes, it returns the correct result. It returns 6. Uh, but it also modified my input. So now my input is an empty list. All right, And this sucks, because now my sum equals product is false, because when it, it doesn't even matter what I do with product, because it's being passed an empty list now. So side effects happen in all sorts of circumstances. These are kind of the smell side effects. If there's no input, then clearly there's got to be some side effect. Like clearly the data is coming from somewhere outside of that function. The same sort of issue happens if there's no output. If there's no output, what is like this clearly is having a side effect somewhere. You just don't know exactly where that's happening. Um, a little sneakier one is when output cannot be derived from the input. Uh, so for example, in this case, suppose I've got some cursor and I'm trying to like, you know, or some query on a database and I want to get a number of results. 
and I have one parameter that lets me limit the number of results I get from that query. So that seems reasonable, but really, like, this is sort of deceptive, because even though it has inputs and outputs, they don't match up at all. There's no way for me to actually get the query results from that integer that I put in. It's just modifying uh, some side affecting function. Uh, and then the ones I really hate are when, the, when you modify the input. And this is actually straight from the Android source code. Um, View.get hit, hit rect, uh, you pass in a rectangle, and it modifies that rectang rectangle instead of you actually getting one back. I, I assume this was done for like uh, performance's sake, but it's worth knowing that like this is a huge side effect. So in my mind, functional programming then becomes about these pure functions. Pure functions are ones that don't have any of those problems that, you, that I just outlined. All they can take is their inputs, and they're a very well-defined set of inputs, and all that is the result is a very well-defined set of outputs. It has no effect on the global state of the application. It only has effect on that particular function. And it makes the code so much easier to reason about when you, have function, when you use functional programming, because suddenly I don't have to like, analyze. I don't have to go into every function and figure out what exactly is going on. I can just assume that like, each function theoretically should be treated like a mathematical equation. You should be able to like, take your whole application, and line it up from end to end, and just solve for x, and then it all works. Another part of functional programming I think is important is immutable data. Because if you have mutable data, then you can start having some weird side effects on the actual inputs and outputs. So you end up with a lot of immutable data. And again, I think this simplifies the code. Um, it's sort of a weird thing to wrap your head around at first. Like the first time I heard about immutable data, I was like, how does anything ever execute if you can't change the state? Um, but it actually isn't, it isn't so hard. It's just saying that when you want to change state, you have to create a new instance of any given like, object. But this, this makes it very simple to you get, a, you, know, you get something from a function, and you know that that thing you got from the function is never going to change. It actually makes it much easier to reason about the code then. It's really weird if you get something back from a function, and then something on some other thread happens to like modify that data that you got back. Like you can get some really wonky code going on. And then I think uh, um, the end result of, having, of <laughs> building a language that's based around pure functions and immutable data is that you really get into these higher order functions, which I haven't explained yet, and I will now. Um, so suppose we've got this nice, actually pure function. Um, in Java, you can't actually guarantee that any function is pure because of that, you know, because of static. You can always call system.out.println anywhere you want in Java. Uh, but this is, this is pure enough. And it takes a list of integers, and it goes through that list, and it doubles the value and returns a new list. So it doesn't modify the input. It, out, it outputs exactly what you expect. If you have like, the numbers 1, 2, and 3, it'll output the numbers 2, 4, and 6. All right? This is great and all, but it's very inflexible. Because what if I want to like triple all the numbers? What if I want to divide all the numbers by something? Well, now I've got to like write a new, I've got to copy and paste this code like as many times as I want to change things. That doesn't seem to make any sense. Uh, so it would be a lot better is if I have this interface that's a function. And this function is going to be, you know, I'm going to take an input uh, integer and I'm going to output an integer. And so now I can create this function called map. Instead of my double values, I've got this map function. And it takes in a list of uh, integers just like before, but it also takes in this mapping function. And from that, then, I can say, for the output, take all of the input and run it through this mapping function. And so this is what higher order programming is, is the ability to take functions, treat them as a first class object, and be able to pass them around and apply them in different locations. Because now what I have is I can essentially call this code. So I've got this list of numbers, and then I can call map on that list of numbers and provide this like little, this is the lambda if you've never seen one before, but basically it says, you know, take, any, take every input and double it. But now if I want to do anything else to this list of integers, I can very easily just, all I have to do is change that little function, and now my map function applies to any integer to integer transformation that I want. But really, that is not going far enough, because obviously you don't always just convert integers into integers, you often want to convert anything into anything else, and that's easy with generics. Easy, because generics are easy. Um, but now I've got this generic function. So it's no longer just taking an integer to an integer. Now it's going from t to r. And I've got this mapping function, which is now littered with the letters t and r. But essentially, the end result is that I can take a list of t and output a uh, list of r as a response. And so now, uh, before I had this numbers and doubled, you know, these are both integers. I can instead. Uh, switch to, let's say, a list of words. So it's a list of strings. And then when I map it, I'm going to map it to the length of those, each string. 
And so now what I get is a, a list of integers. Ta-da! So this is pretty cool. This has been your crash course in functional programming. There is so much more to learn about it um, than I'm going over here, but this is enough for me to demonstrate what I want to be able to talk to you about in reactive, in the world of reactive streams. Remember, this is where this talk started with. So let's, let's examine an issue with my previous light switch and light bulb example. So in my first example, the switch was represented, the switch's state was represented by Booleans. But let's imagine that when someone wrote the switch, they decided they were going to use enums instead. And so they've got this state on and off enum. They wanted to have it be very well designed, maybe over architected in this case. And now what returns from my flips method is not an observable of Boolean, but an observable of states. And if you remember the rest of this code, what, I've, what my light bulb creation method has, it takes in an observable of Booleans. So now I've got this issue, which is that the, they don't match up anymore. All right, I've got observable of states, and I can't pass this into my, uh, into my light bulb creation method. Ah, but what did we just learn about map? In map, we could take a list of t and convert it into a list of r. What if we had a mapping function in reactive world that allowed us to convert a list of states into a list of booleans? And indeed, that is one of the basic building blocks of reactive streams is this map operator. So this is a much more complicated marble diagram than I showed before. But essentially, what it's showing here is that on the top line, there's time. And it's got circles going down. Uh, and we can imagine those being different states in our case. And then it's passed to this mapping function. And the mapping function takes circles and turns them into squares. And then the output you get from that is a new observable, a new collection over time. And that new collection over time is the same exact thing as the states, only now it's these squares. So I can take my collection of states and turn it into a collection of squares. So how does that code kind of look? Well, now I've got uh, my switch. And from that switch, I can get my state observable. By the way, I made a big mistake by using light switch, light bulb example at the start because I realized I wanted to call my variable switch everywhere. But it turns out that switch is a reserved keyword in Java. So uh, that made all of my code really awkward. So it has to be the switch. Um, OK, so I've got my observable of states. Now what I want is an observable of Boolean. And look, there's this mapping function. It's actually built into observable itself. Um, and I just call, you know, I take my state observable, I just call dot map. And I say, I'm going to say that whenever the state equals on, then that's going to return true. Otherwise, it'll just return false. And now I can take that Boolean observable and hook it into my light bulb creation method. So this is really cool. Now I can take streams and actually modify them to be whatever I want them to be. Um, and what it's using in this case is kind of that functional programming style where I'm passing a higher order function. It's a pure function which doesn't really mess with the global state. All it does is modify this particular stream of data. So to apply that to something a little more real world again, let's look again at the uh, Trello homepage, which is drawing its data from a database. But really, it's not like that's very vague. Really, what I'm doing is I'm drawing from multiple databases. So for example, I've got like a database of teams and a database of boards. So teams are kind of like a collection of boards and users. Um, so there's like a Trello team, and there's like my personal team, and stuff like that. Um, and then I've got a collection of boards, which are all the individual boards that you see lined up. Now, the issue is that if I have these, if I'm just listening to these two separate database tables as like two different streams, things get really ugly really quickly. Because actually what I want is to be able to collate the current set of teams with the current set of boards so I can display them on the UI nicely. What I don't want to have to do is worry about some concurrency issue where I get like a new board that's supposed to be listed under some team, but the team database hasn't quite updated yet, and so I don't have that information from it, and then my UI crashes. So that makes me really sad. Uh, what would be really cool is if there was a way to combine these two streams. It turns out there is. There's, a, there's an operator called combine latest. And essentially what it lets me do is it takes these two streams of data, the team's data and the board's data. It puts, plugs these two streams into one place. And the way the combined latest works is whenever the latest data comes from either stream, it calls this common, uh, combining function, this combining function that I define. And that allows me to define how I want to collate these teams and boards together. And then that combined latest can then spit out its data to, this, to the UI, which allows me to actually uh, ha handle those concurrency issues nicely. And really, like, this is what 
is super powerful about reactive streams in general is that it provides all of these different operators for combining streams and changing the flow of data. And in fact, one might say it provides like way too many operators. And this is usually the part of the talk in introducing ArcGIS where you go over someone's head because then you're like, look at all these cool, look at all these cool different operators, look what you can do with distinct until change and all these debound stuff and whatever. All right, this is a long list of things that you can do to data. And if you get into RxJava, uh, you'll learn it piecemeal, you'll learn it a little bit at a time. Um, but uh, suffice to say, essentially what they're doing is they're telling you like, you, you've got a very common way of dealing with uh, the flow of data. Here's some ways to help you out with that. So when you want to change the flow of data or you want to transform the data that's, be, that's going through, here's a whole bunch, bunch of ways of doing that. Uh, and I'm not going to go over any of them. So, what is functional reactive programming? The, the, the thing I was trying to answer from the start of this talk, it is reactive streams combined with functional operators. That's all it is. So it took us about, what, 30 minutes to explain that. Cool, so you all know what RxJava essentially is doing now. That's what functional reactive programming is. Um, a little asterisk on FRP in particular though, there was someone in the late 80s, I believe, who came up with functional reactive programming which meant something completely different. And he named it functional reactive programming. Uh, and unfortunately, he's losing out to like popular culture. So like you may occasionally see someone be like, but FRP is actually this weird time dilated thing. And it's like, no. Um, like that's what he called it. And I feel bad for him that he happened to like land on this. But it turns out it's, this is a really good term. And like people just kind of push back and been like, it's our term now. So. <laughs> All right. I've talked enough about like FRP. So why, why would you want to use it? Like a quick like. You understand what it is now. Why would you want to use this? Um, and I want to kind of be a little succinct about this. But so the reactive stream side of things, uh, the reason I like it is because you get modularity from it. I think the modularity that reactive streams provides makes more sense. Um, <laughs> in the same way that pure functions, you have a well-defined set of inputs and outputs. Uh, you have the same sort of thing with your modules with reactive streams. You can define what observables you would like to be input to this module and you can define what observables it spits out as a response. So you can set up these, this nice set of data that actually controls the module, and you know exactly what controls the module. Um, so that's good from both a design standpoint, like coding, you know exactly what you need in and out. It's also great from a testing standpoint, because then all of these observables that are, you're inputting into your module, those can all be mocked very easily. You can, they don't have to actually be hooking up to like whatever modules you intend them to hook up to. In your unit test, you can hook up to whatever you want. And the other advantage of reactive streams in my mind is that they're inherently asynchronous. They're inherently in asynchronous data type. And if you've ever been through callback hell, you know what it's like to try to do proactive coding in a non-inherently asynchronous setup. Um, whereas observables are very nicely designed to work in an asynchronous world. And really when you're working on almost any piece of code, that's actually how the wor real world works. You're making network requests, you're making requests to the database, you're updating the database. All these things actually take time. And you're not allowed to just block execution for all of it, especially not if you're writing Android apps. So this inherently asynchronous nature makes it a lot more appropriate for dealing with the real world of coding. And as for the functional operators, what it does is it gives you this ability to control the flow of those streams. So you're not just stuck writing the basic observer pattern a million times. Instead, you have this great framework, Arcs, Java, or our extremes, or any, like there's many, many frameworks uh, across many different languages for FRP that allows you to, to uh, control exactly how the data is going about. And then it also gives you ability to reproduce a lot of common logic. A lot of common logic like you wanting to have the concurrency of multiple streams, you want to combine multiple streams into one. Uh, it makes it very easy to do stuff like that. All right, some resources if you want to learn more or read up more on things. Um, first of all, a couple of years ago, I wrote an introduction into RxJava, which is much more of a nuts and bolts sort of like, here's the practical, like actual code side of things. Um, so if you actually want to learn more about RxJava, I recommend reading that post. Um, I would like to thank CycleJS for their streams expl explanation, which I stole heavily from for this talk. I think they had a really good way of explaining how uh, streams works. Um, and CycleJS itself is a very cool project to check out because they, they're starting to deal with this whole unidirectional uh, architecture of flow of data, which has become more and more popular, like with React and whatnot, where uh, 
instead of having model view controller, you have the model view and the controller, and there's all these arrows between them. Instead of imagine you just have a single flow of data in a nice circle, uh, things get a lot easier to solve. So it's kind of fun to look into Cycle.js and how it uses reactive streams as like the core object for driving this unidirectional arch architecture. The uh, function returns, like the async versus sync, many versus one, that was taken from a talk from Eric Meyer, who's one of the original inventors of reactive stream uh, extensions. And his talk is very math mathy, um, but it's, I think, brilliant. It's really, really a cool watch if you want to like learn exactly. He, he essentially goes through, like, imagine you have this synchronous iterable, and I want to derive an asynchronous version of it. And he derives observable from the iterable. So if you just, it's like observable just becomes an, an asynchronous imagining of iterable. And it's, I think, very cool. And if you want to get more into functional programming, I think Haskell is a pretty cool language. Um, it's, it's interesting. There's a, there's a whole variety of functional programming languages. Some of them allow you to cheat more than others. So for example, like Scala, you can get into functional programming. But you can also just break out of it and do some imperative coding if you feel like it. Haskell does not let you get away with that at all, which is kind of fun. So uh, if you really want to learn like, act, like how, to, how to work with functional programming, I, learn, I would check out Haskell because it was really fun. And um, what I'm linking to here is Learn You a Haskell, which is a free book that I learned from. And I think it's pretty cool. It's a fun one. Um, it's free. You can, I mean, you can buy it uh, if you want to kick him some bucks, but he puts it all online for free as well. Anyways, thank you very much for listening. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I would be happy to answer them now. Everything was solved. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, I'm going to just repeat that because I know this is being recorded. So the question was, um, do you have trouble integrating RxJava with other external libraries that do not use RxJava? Um, and the answer is not really, because it's fairly easy these days to take um, other libraries and wrap it into an observable. So uh, for example, there's a whole Rx binding project, which uh, takes all of the views and, that you know and love in Android, like all those listeners, and wraps it so that you can actually use it as an observable instead. So that's typically what we're doing, is we're just we'll just take whatever that library provides and wrap it in a way that lets us use it as if it was designed with RxJava in mind. Thought I saw another hand somewhere here, but maybe not. All right, cool. I'll be around if people want to talk about this stuff anymore, but I won't take up any more of your time. We can get out a little bit early and go get lunch if it's being served yet. Anyways, thank you.